Club, and I am back with Jim McConnell. Jim and I last time did an awesome video on how to identify the difference between hybrid gels and true gels. So hopefully you guys watch that. If you didn't, I highly recommend you go back and watch that. And also, Jim has an awesome series called The Chemist Corner. You just recently started doing that. We did. We did. It's we just wanted to bring awesome. the truth to the industry. Very cool. Put it out there. Yeah. Um, almost like uh, pulling the curtain away and showing, you know, the magician behind yes. all of what's going on. And you guys know I hate smoke and mirrors. So Jim hates smoke and mirrors as well. He's all about bringing truth and quality to the nail industry, which is why we get along. Um, but if you guys go over to the Light Elegance YouTube channel, and I'll make sure there's a link down below my video as well. Um, you guys should check out Chemist Corner because it's a great playlist of chemistry information. You can get as deep into the technical stuff as you want to. And you explain, I mean, literally everything there is to know about everything. Right. Okay. And more, more to come. We've, yeah. we've only just touched the surface. Yeah. So the idea is that we plan on releasing a lot more. Uh, so that'll be awesome. It'll be very cool. Yeah. So I'm here with Jim because I know a lot of topics I've gone over on my channel. I kind of keep it at a layman's term level, and I also use a lot of analogies, but I wanted to take that back to the source and talk with a real chemist like Jim and get you guys those hard answers about what really is going on inside of these products and what are some of the answers to all of your guys' questions. So today we're going to be talking about HEMA. Now HEMA is one of those words that if you're not familiar with it yet, great. But if you have heard HEMA or you've had an experience with HEMA, it's kind of one of those crazy words that's taken the industry by storm and Recently. people have a huge reaction to it. And a lot of us don't even know why we have a huge reaction Physically to it. Physically and emotionally. Physically and emotionally. So HEMA is one of those things that's just kind of cropped. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's raised its ugly head recently. And I wanted to get down to the source of, we're going to talk about what HEMA is, mm -hmm. why HEMA could potentially cause problems, and how HEMA causes problems, right? That's basically what we're going to be going over. That's what we're hitting. Okay, cool. Yeah, and I, I got to say, there's some yeah. people probably watching this right now. They're like, oh, careful. Yes. This, we, we are fully aware that this is a touchy subject, but we're not here to, you know, raise up our pitchforks and torches. We're actually here to just break this down at a fundamental level, which is how I like doing things, mm -hmm. talking about the facts, and then everyone else can make their own decisions about what they want to purchase, what they want to use, and addressing how they feel the about issues. It. Yeah, addressing and the issues. And what's important for you as a nail technician, if you're using a product that does contain HEMA, how do you do it safely? Yes, absolutely, because it is something that's out there. Or if you look at the ingredient list or an SDS for something that says HEMA, is it bound? Is it free HEMA? Yes, yes, because it's not always something that you see HEMA on a label, and I've seen this a lot on Facebook, just you know, with this conversation. As soon as someone sees the letters H-E-M-A, it's like full stop. Ah. Throw this in the garbage, light it on fire, you know, get away, right? Back away safely. But we wanted to talk a little bit about what HEMA is, how you can identify what those kind of better versions of HEMA are, and maybe what some of the more volatile ones are, and how you can kind of be aware of all of these different things. Yep. Yeah. Knowledgeable consumer is what we're trying to make you guys into. You know what? The more information you have. Yeah. The safer you are. Yeah. The more you know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you do that? That was nice. <laughs> All right. Cool. So let's start off with what HEMA is. What the heck is HEMA? HEMA is, its chemical name is 2-hydroxyethyl methacrylate. Okay. HEMA, H for the hydroxy, mm -hmm. E for the ethyl, M, meth, yep. and then acrylate, A. Okay. So the 2 in front of all of that tells us where some of the molecules are placed, some of the additions to the backbone of HEMA. Okay, so people might see like 2-HEMA. Two 2-HEMA two, two or 2-hydroxyethyl methacrylate. Spelled out. Mm -hmm. Or just H-E-M-A, HEMA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, or you might just see hydroxyethyl methacrylate. Okay. So you'll see all of those. And there's a few other names for HEMA yep. that shouldn't be used, but I've seen them on labels. Yeah, and this is where it gets really confusing because there's a bazillion names for one single ingredient, it seems like. Right, and so in the chemical industry, we have nomenclature that's supposed to be used for chemical items, and that nomenclature is called IUPAC, I-U-P-A-C, and I can't remember what it means. But, um, so IUPAC names are the official chemical name, but in the cosmetics industry, basically with the advent of the EU Cosmetics Directive, mm -hmm. 
we were supposed to use names that are inky listed, so international cosmetics mm -hmm. listing. Right. Um, and when you have that international nomenclature for cosmetic ingredients, mm -hmm. when you have those names, they don't necessarily match with the IUPAC names. So on a, on a bottle, if this is a bottle and it has the ingredients listed, on here you're supposed to see the inky names, not necessarily the IUPAC right. names. Right. Some chemical companies are listing the IUPAC names and not the inky names. Yeah. And some things like HEMA might have three or four different IUPAC names that are appropriate and descriptive, mm -hmm. but not inky names. Yep. And, and so, sometimes, like we talked about in our last video, what's on the bottle is different than what's on the SDS sheet. Or what's on the bottle and the SDS sheet is different than what's in the container. Yeah, we've seen that as well. Yeah, a lot. All right, so HEMA is, I mean, is it a necessary component in gels? I mean, why yeah. is there HEMA in gels? So the great, that's a great question. I want to address that for a while now, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So HEMA is added because HEMA actually gives us really good adhesion to the natural nail. Okay. Okay. So natural nails are made of keratin, keratin protein. and keratin protein likes things that are carboxy or carboxylic acids. Mm -hmm. And HEMA is sort of a long chain carboxylic acid with a hydroxyl group on one end. The hydroxyl group is an it's OH group. It is, a, it is a mouthful. It's a mouthful. So if I say stuff that you want a little clarification on, you can always yeah. post that down below in the question yep. area and Liz will point that out to yeah. me and yeah. I can give you an answer. But it's good to hear it because the, the more you hear these names, the more you become familiar with these things. I mean, there's a lot of words I used to think I will never learn what that is, but the more you become familiar with it, it is good to hear the actual technical name as well. Yeah. So other chemicals that we're really familiar with that have hydroxyl groups, water, Mm -hmm. So hydroxyl is H2O, so H-O-H, -H. it's that O-H part, the, hydro the oxygen coupled with the hydrogen mm -hmm. that is a hydroxyl group. Okay. And there's nothing on the other side of that, it's just an O-H group. Okay. Um, other ones that have hydroxyl groups in there that we love so much, sugar. Mm, I love sugar. How many hydroxyl groups are in sugar? Let's go with six. Okay. All right. Um, lactose. Really? Twelve. Hydroxyl well, lactose groups. is also kind it's of... It's a carb... It's a complex sugar. Yeah. I was going to say it is a sugar as yeah, well. There's so lots of names for sugar out there. There are. Mm -hmm. And so um, that has hydroxyl groups. And most people really love their sugars. I love sugar. And what else? Sugar is made... Is used to make alcohol. Mm-hmm. So alcohol is, is uh, ethyl alcohol, mm -hmm. which uh, has two carbon groups followed by an OH. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so now we know what the OH is whenever yeah. you see those those Iso diagrams of molecules. Isopropanol. You know, we use yeah. it to clean our fingernails. Yeah. Right? Rubbing alcohol has both two different types of hydroxyl products in there. Okay, all right. Water and isopropanol. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, Propanol. and Jim was actually showing me the diagrams of, of what these things look like at a molecular level. And you do actually see on the diagram the OH on the tails of these of these structures that you build to create the gel formulas that we see when we when we use them. Yeah. So that OH group on the HEMA allows it to be more miscible with water products. Oh, okay. So if you have water on your fingernails, which we all do, yep. it allow it doesn't reject the HEMA. Okay. So okay. instead of it being like oil on water, it actually likes like it and it water. bonds. Yeah. Okay. That yeah. makes sense. Okay. So makes HEMA is really good for that adhesion. HEMA is also really good as it's single, it only has one functional reactive site okay. for the UV cured systems or for acrylic systems. Mm -hmm. So because it only has one of those carbon-carbon double bonds on one end that's the methacrylate, mm -hmm. because it only has one of those, it only can enter into one portion of a difunctional reaction. Okay. So it becomes a chain terminator. If chains could get too long, they can become too rigid. Mm. or they can become too brittle okay. or they can become just not good adhesion. So it basically puts bookends on it limits the end of the, the chain. the molecular size of the polymer. Okay, yeah. yeah. And we were also talking earlier a little bit about, um, you know, so would you say HEMA is, and, and again, this is just a, a general question, but is HEMA a monomer? It's a monomer. Okay. So monofunctional monomer. Monofunctional monomer. Okay, so from what I know about monomers is monomers tend to be smaller molecules 
whereas oligomers are bigger ones. Much bigger. And so that's also one of the reasons why HEMA can cause so many problems is because it's small enough that we can actually absorb it into our skin and our bloodstream. Is that correct? It's feasible. It's yes. feasible. Okay. Yeah. So when we point. don't have HEMA attached to anything, when it's not bound and it's just floating around. Like we a were, balloon. Like we were talking about, if you imagine these, these monomers like a bunch of balloons, you know, all nicely tightly held together and they look so pretty and they're all controlled and they're in their little cluster. There's also another version, which is HEMA or these monomers that are just floating around as if you let go of a bunch of balloons and they're just all over the place, right? They just fly around. No one can control them. No one can get them back. So that's kind of, you know, I like to create visuals or analogies on things is if you think about these monomers being controlled in a bundle versus flying around by themselves. Yeah. And how right? often do you see you walking around and maybe the fair was in town and a lot of balloons? Yeah. Balloons are going to be stuck in the trees. They're going to be yep. stuck inside the, the eaves of the buildings. They get out They're of control. They're going to be all over the place. They're going to be out of control, and they will get into nooks and crannies. So that's exactly what we want you guys to think about. So HEMA monomer is a free monomer, mm -hmm. a free HEMA molecule, mm -hmm. can get caught into little nooks and crannies. And if that nook and cranny winds up being your skin, yep. and you have no oil in that skin to protect your your internal organs which we were talking about last time about acetone exposure you were saying it makes your skin more susceptible to absorbing things like this because it rips off that nice protective oil barrier that we have in our skin yeah so Pulls you're more right susceptible out, to and this. then now you just have a, a porous membrane mm -hmm. that things can transfer through okay that makes sense yeah yeah so so okay so hema isn't inherently a bad thing because yeah. like you were saying it creates great adhesion to the natural nail plate yeah. it loves the the natural nail plate just the way it is and it bonds well with that but then one of the downsides of HEMA is that it can get out of control if it's not bound within the formula properly. Right, or if you get it on your skin. Yep. So when you're applying things that contain monomeric HEMA, mm -hmm. you wanna make sure that you avoid skin contact. Okay, and that's why you guys have probably seen on pretty much every label that's out there for, for nail care products is avoid skin contact. Right? Which is really tough to do if you're applying it so close to the skin. It's very, very hard to do. And we've, we've talked about that a lot on my channel as well. I mean, and you, you do this as well here at Light Elegance is talking about the way we cleanse nails, the way we apply the product, you know, making sure that we're not getting that inhibition layer. Now you guys know what the inhibition layer is, um, you know, after watching my video on that, which is it's uncured product, right? So knowing all of those things, we're able to really mitigate that risk. But there are ways that we can make formulas even safer than having all of these crazy balloon flying versions of HEMA around. Right. Okay. And so if you see HEMA on the ingredient list, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But question might come up, what's the concentration of HEMA in a system? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you have 40, 50% concentration of HEMA in a gel polish system, that increases the chance of becoming allergic to the HEMA. Mm -hmm. Just like if you had 40, 50% uh, balloons in there, you might become allergic to balloons. Right. But if you have that high concentration of HEMA, then the issue becomes, will I become allergic to it? If someone has a lower concentration, 15, 20%, mm -hmm. 5%, uh, those lower concentrations of HEMA and then other monomers mm -hmm. that could be in the system, will dissipate the potential of an allergic reaction taking place to just HEMA. Mm, okay. Okay. So there's other molecules that we can use that also have good reactions, mm -hmm. good adhesion to the natural nail, mm -hmm. um, like take HEMA's sibling, HPMA. Okay. So hydroxypropyl methacrylate. So hydroxypropyl methacrylate has one additional carbon atom in the backbone. And that hydroxypropyl methacrylate is less allergenic than HEMA. There are studies that say that it's not that much less allergenic, but if you have an allergy to HEMA, mm -hmm. but you might not have an allergy to HPMA. Well, that's so interesting. If you did like a 50 50 blend as a chemist between yep. HEMA and HPMA, you might wind up taking something that has 50% HEMA to 25 and 25, making it a little bit safer to use. Yep, yep. Okay. okay. Then there's other monomers you can put in there as well. Okay. And so, I mean, why is there so much monomer in our products? I know here at Light Elegance, you guys focus a lot on oligomers. oligomers. And maybe you could explain just really quick what an oligomer is and how it compares to a monomer. A, an oligomer is typically a molecule that's been built based on the backbone of one of the resins. So okay. if you look at our ingredient list, you might see bis hema mm -hmm. and then poly 
1,4-butane-diol-9 IPDI copolymer. Another mouthful. Yeah. So when you, when you put that on the label, it, it's basically HEMA, but it's been attached to the 1,4-butane-diol molecules. There's nine of them. Mm -hmm. That's where the nine comes mm -hmm. from. Nine 1,4-BDL okay. of those capped with the IPDI. Mm -hmm. And then on the other end of the IPDI, the isoferon diacyanate, you, now you have the HEMA. So the HEMA is actually bound chemically to, the iso okay. to that isoferon diacyanate. So you've taken that little HEMA balloon bound. and tied it to the end right. of your ligamer chain. Yeah. Okay. And so we've built a really big molecule. So HEMA's molecular weight is actually quite small. Mm -hmm. Off the top of my head, I want to say it's like 130 grams per mole. But when you couple it with everything else, that entire molecule might be 1,400 grams per mole. Okay. So the oligomer is much larger, say 10 times the size mm -hmm. of HEMA monomer. And as a result of all of that, it's less likely to enter your bloodstream if yeah. it comes in contact with your skin, Yeah. which and, makes it safer. And that's the whole reason why, you know, a company like, like, like Elegance can actually promote the fact that their product is hypoallergenic. Now, we had touched on this, just Jim and I talking earlier, the fact that hypoallergenic doesn't mean allergy proof, but it does mean that it's less likely to cause allergies. Hypo right? being less. Hypo being less. So that's something that's really important for you guys to also consider when choosing product lines or choosing products to use on yourself are the fact that, number one, you're buying from a company that does think about these things, yep. right? Not someone that's just buying something from somewhere, sticking their label on it and, and away and running. Um, but also the fact that there are these, these kind of things that you need to think about. You need to think about the contents in your product and you don't have to know all of the crazy mouthful, long chemical words, but at the same time, knowing that there are differences between you know, a brand that uses long oligomer chains versus a brand that uses a ton of monomer. Now, how would that choice also affect you know, price point, for example? Because we were also talking a little bit earlier before about you know, why companies choose to put so much monomer in their product versus you know, choosing to put more oligomers in their product. And and how there's, you know, you get what you pay for, essentially. A lot of the monomers that we use are cheap. So HEMA is really inexpensive. Mm -hmm. So if I want to make something that's going to be cost competitive, right? more HEMA, the better. Because mm -hmm. it reduces my raw material cost. So there are some monomers that are more expensive than HEMA. Mm -hmm. So if you mix HEMA with HPMA, HPMA is more expensive yep. than HEMA. And as a result, your cost goes up. If you use other ones, like you might see tripropylene, tripropyl methanol, trimethacrylate in there. Mm -hmm. And if you see that in that product, it's also really expensive. So those more expensive monomers are less likely to cause allergies. Okay. And they're less common in the products. And as a result, it will influence the cost. Mm -hmm. Oligomers, on the other hand, are mega expensive. So compared to HEMA, uh, the oligomers are about 10 times the cost. Okay. And as a result of that increase in cost, we are looking at a more safe product to use mm -hmm. in most cases. But at the same time, it comes as a detriment as well. Because you have less HEMA, it might require a different prep method. Right. Because you're not HEMA get does that add adhesion. all that adhesion. Yeah. 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 All right. That makes sense. Yeah. So... Um, we were also talking about, like you were talking about the bound HEMA, we were talking about what HEMA is, um, and we also kind of talked about you know, how HEMA causes allergies because it is a smaller molecule. It's able to more easily penetrate our skin, enter our bloodstream, which isn't inherently a bad thing, but it's our body's immune system reaction to that foreign thing coming into our body that can potentially cause the allergy. So that's also why some people may have a really severe allergic reaction to this product, whereas others may not. It really comes down to your body chemistry and whether or not your immune system says, get this stuff out of here, I don't want it. Or it's like, no big deal, I don't care if it's in my body. It's okay, yeah. Right? yeah it depends upon what your body's accustomed to and what it can tolerate. Right. So, and did it identify an, an allergen or a potential allergen? And all of a sudden you have swelling, flaring, Maybe Red, blistering. Itchy, yeah, peeling, cracking. So for those of you that have had that experience where sometimes it's even your nail plate lifts off the finger a little bit, um, you might have itchy, swelling, um, you know, blisters, cracking red, skin. cracking, peeling. 
And unfortunately, one of the things that happens with this is once you're allergic to something like HEMA, there's really no going back. There's really no going back. You have to find a product that does not contain free HEMA. Right, right. Yeah, HEMA monomer. Yeah, so that's uh, that's something that's very prevalent right now between, you know, not only professional nail technicians, but also the clients that those professional nail techs are working on. And this is a very serious topic. And, you know, Jim and I are fully aware that this is a very heated conversation, but that's why it's really important for you all to understand what this is and how it plays a role in our products so that you can be aware of it, be more cautious about it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you don't need to get out your pitchforks and, and freak out about HEMA, but at least you're aware of, you know, what the consequences of it being in your products are. And also an idea of how much to watch out for, what kind of HEMA to watch out for. Like you may not necessarily know what the concentration of a HEMA is in a system, mm-hmm. but where does it fall on the ingredient list? Oh, okay. So even on the bottle, if it's listed first, it would be a high, high concentration. concentration. Okay. If it's listed somewhere in the middle, it's a lower concentration. If it's listed at the end, it's in trace amounts. Okay. All right. Yeah. That makes sense. So, I mean, do you think that HEMA's, I mean, here to stay? Do you think, you know, it'll get replaced by something else? Or do you think it's 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 one of those things where if you, you know, with moderation, it's actually a good thing to include in products? With moderation, you're okay. Do okay. we put HEMA in our products? No. No. Okay. We found ways around it. Okay. It, it's more expensive. Yeah. But it's also safer. Yeah. For people who are allergic to HEMA. It's yeah. not safer for everybody. But it's, if you have an allergy to HEMA and you use light elegance, you're not going to have a problem. Yeah. And that's very important. And, unless you develop an allergy to something that we do use. And that's also the case too, which is it's not just HEMA that you can get allergic to. If you're abusing your products, and I've talked about this in my safety video before, we talked about, you know, sticking your brush in your mouth or using your bare hands don't do to, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, using your bare hands to clean things. I mean, even something as simple as every time you do a gel polish manicure, you take your thumb and you use your own finger to clean the sidewalls. Every time you do that, you're touching uncured product. Yeah. Now, this is the thing increasing that a lot of people- Increasing your exposure. Increasing your exposure. And this is the thing that a lot of people don't understand as well, which is the uncured part of the product is where we've got the majority of the problem, right? Because when it's uncured is uncured when all of those things under-cured. are floating around without being bonded to one another. You're allowing that balloon to escape. Okay. So think about that as well. This is also why I've talked a lot about the inhibition layer, about how we don't scrub up and down the finger with our nail wipes, how we don't use one nail wipe for all 10 fingers, all of these little things that can be really bad habits. I also want you guys to take accountability for because even something that could be a completely safe ingredient, if it's not used appropriately, could be something that causes a problem. Yeah. And it's not necessarily the nail technician that learned the right way and chose a different way. Sometimes people are educated in ways that make sense for one person, yep. but can lead to problems later on. And it's not bad intent or anything like that. No, not at all. just trying to think about every little thing that you do when you're doing it. Yeah. So that I, when I teach a class and I want to cleanse someone's nail, I take the, the cleansing wipe and I put some cleanser on there and then I fold it in quarters. Mm-hmm. And then I make a little tent out of it and I only clean the fingernail. Yep and I avoid contact with the skin. And I'll clean four nails or five nails with it, then I refold it and then clean around the skin Mm -hmm. with maybe a different wipe or that same wipe if it wasn't contaminated with a lot of uncured residue. Right. And then that ensures that that skin is nice and clean Mm -hmm. and that everything has been removed and then you're good to go for the next part of the surgery. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's just a matter of, you know, sometimes there's just a lack of education out there about these types of topics. We all get so sucked into the fun parts of the nail world, you know, and like, oh, my gosh, the glitters and the colors and all the fun stuff. But there's also a very serious part of what we do. And that's where I think the technician part of our title really comes in because we need to have that expertise as far as what we're using, how we're supposed to use it and all the equipment and tools that go with all the fun stuff. So that's the whole idea behind this is just educating you guys about all of these different ingredients, what they do and you know how important it is to know all of these different things. And you bring up the good point. And while all of this is a lot of fun, it creates really beautiful things works of art on the ends of people's fingernails that get removed a couple weeks later. That is enormously great. Yep. But the technical part, you do have to remember that you are a chemical technician. Absolutely. And you're working with chemicals that can cause allergies, Mm -hmm. could cause allergies, but they're not handled correctly. So make sure your working surface is always clean. Make sure that you change out table towels on a regular Mm -hmm. basis. Don't leave a lot of dust 
yeah. laying around. Yeah, use a dust evacuation system as well so you don't get all of that particle, you know, stuff all over your body as you're working because we all know dust gets everywhere. As how many filing. times have you seen someone at a salon where they take a table towel and just snap it off to the <laughs> side and put it back? Yeah, you shaking know, all that stuff all up into your... it up, put it in a, in a bag, yeah. take it home, do your laundry, and then bring it back clean. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, these are just the things that not a lot of people talk about. Yeah, so making sure that you think about every part of, this, of the process while you're doing those fingernails is crucial. It's really crucial. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to talk about a little bit on SDS work or ingredients in yes. what bound HEMA is? Yeah, so I definitely want to make sure that before we end this video that you guys are not only aware of you know, what HEMA is, how HEMA causes allergies, and why HEMA causes allergies, but also how do we identify if there's HEMA in our products, right? Yeah. Because you guys are going to be out there trying to find gel polish that probably doesn't have HEMA in it or has, you know, bound HEMA, safer types of HEMA, low concentrations of HEMA. And now that you guys are aware of this topic, I'm sure you guys are going to ask, how the heck do I know what's in the stuff that I'm out yeah, there thanks buying? Thanks for telling me I should be a, I should be cautious, but now what do I do? <laughs> right? Now what do I do? Now what do I do? Yeah. So if you can please show us, you know, what we should be looking for, how to identify these things, and, you know, even what an SDS sheet and how to read it. Yeah. I'd be happy to. Cool. Yeah. And we might do the SDS sheet separate? Yes. Yes. So as uh, Jim's plan is actually, as we're doing this, to create a separate video on SDS sheet deep diving into SDS sheets and MSDS sheets because that's also a little confusing. But if you can kind of go over, like if we were to look at an SDS sheet, you know, what would we look for and, and what are the things that maybe we should stay away from? Yeah, so when I do that video, I'll concentrate on the concentrations, the chemicals, the raw materials that are included in that mm -hmm. compounded product, Yep. as well as if you do expose yourself to it, what sections of the SDS sheet do you need to pay attention to to make sure that you can get your skin cleaned mm -hmm. as safely as possible without reintroducing other other potential problems? Awesome. And that way you are safe. So the SDS sheets don't become scary. And by the way, one thing that's really important to know uh -huh. is if you want an SDS sheet, companies who make products and supply that product to you are legally bound yes. to supply you with an accurate SDS sheet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you ask the company that you're buying a product from or that you already own a company a product from and they can't answer your question or they can't provide this type of information, buyer beware. Buyer beware. Buyer beware. Yeah. The more knowledge you have, the better off you are. If they're not Absolutely. willing to provide that knowledge to you, then maybe you should probably think about where you're buying your products. Where you're buying your products from. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. All right. To the dry erase board. Let's do it. Or two. Ema. Or two oh my gosh that's a long word <laughs> two hydroxyethyl methacrylate yeah that's why a lot of people like to go with this or go from that makes sense makes sense <laughs> so that's nice to see Right, so if you see these items in the inky listing, you know that it's in there. Okay. Now, if you see to HEMA followed by a comma, if you see that in the ingredient list and there's no comma in front of it, it is the first ingredient on that list. Okay. Right, which means that that's the major component. Mm -hmm. If you see a comma in front of that and it's listed just as this, or just as comma, mm -hmm. then it's not one of the major components. It may be farther up the list of concentration, but okay. it may not be the biggest ingredient. Okay. But I've seen a lot of things where there's no comma. So it is the largest, most prominent ingredient in that formulation. Okay. And all of these are that free type of HEMA free that you're talking HEMA, about. Free HEMA, the solo balloon, solo floating balloons, free. Solo balloons, floating around, getting cotton trees. Getting cotton trees in the eaves yes. of the houses. Yep. They go everywhere. They go everywhere. So this is HEMA as okay. a monomer. Okay. So when we take HEMA and we add it to something, this is where it gets bound. Okay. So you might see this HEMA poly. One, one, four, butane, dial, nine, IPDI, 
copolymer. So that's an important but, thing to know is bishema by itself is not the same thing as this bishema poly. Right. Usually you don't see bishema as its own because okay. it doesn't want to react with itself too much. The only place that it will really react with itself is if you have the, the methyl group reacting, or sorry, the uh, methacrylate group reacting with the other methacrylate group to itself. So you can do that with mm -hmm. peroxide or photo initiator. Mm -hmm. But now you just have two hydroxyl groups okay. hanging off the end. And then what about dihema? Is dihema the same thing? So this is the same thing as dihema. Okay, that's good to know because a lot the, I've seen a lot of bottles with dihema on it as well. Same, same. Same, same. Same, same. Okay. So, but in this case, what we have is we have this hema, which has been bonded to the IPDI copolymer, which has been bonded to the poly 14 butane diol 9. Here's your built polyurethane polyol. Mm -hmm. So, that's been constructed in a lab mm -hmm. or in a manufacturing facility. Mm -hmm. That gets reacted with your IPDI, which is isoferone diisocyanate. Okay. That basically makes a moisture cure polyurethane. Okay. So this can now react with water and form its own polymer. We need the HEMA to be bonded to this so it can cure with peroxides ah. or photo initiators. Ah, okay. So we're making UV gel now. Yeah. So that becomes the gel. Okay. Okay. Very cool. If I expose this to a peroxide like what you might find in acrylic systems, mm -hmm. It will cure it, but it'll cure it slowly. If you take HEMA and expose it to a peroxide, like in an acrylic system, mm -hmm. it reacts quite quickly. Okay. Okay. So polyurethane polyol mm -hmm. reacted with an isocyanate, then reacted with the HEMA. Okay. And there's two HEMA groups that react with the two IPDI groups, mm -hmm. which react with the one poly 14 butane diol dash nine. Okay. Backbone. So if you see this on a label, whether it's on an SDS sheet or, well, SDS, because SDS is SDS sheet, or a bottle with this listed on it, then this would mean that this is bound HEMA. Chemically bound. Cannot which means be it's going to be safer than if you saw the previous one we just talked about, which is HEMA all by itself. Very correct. Okay. Very correct. You also might say see this HEA. Mm -hmm. I've seen that as well. So a bis HEA is not dihema, it's a di HEA. Those are the exact same thing. And if you do a bis HEA, this is a hydroxyethyl acrylate. So it's the sibling to HEMA, mm -hmm. but because it's acrylated, not methacrylated, it reacts a lot faster than the HEMA does. Mm -hmm. It will also help with curing tack free. So okay. some of your gel polishes that are coming in from other countries, mm -hmm. I'm not naming any countries, but <laughs> but they'll they, they'll use the the HEA mm -hmm. as a as a solo monomer, free monomer in their HEA to thin out the viscosity. It's a lot thinner than the HEMA is. Um, they'll thin out the viscosity. It reacts a lot faster, but it's also extremely allergenic. Okay. So in these cases. If you have HEA as a free free monomer in there, mm -hmm. and that's in the system, mm -hmm. and it cures tack free, you could have some problems. Okay, so if we see HEA all by itself without this or dye in front of it, there that, a, that would be a little mental red flag. There's a big mental red flag. I've seen HEA as the first ingredient on a gel polish. Wow. So you will develop an allergy to it. Yeah. That's and we tried point. applying it to one of our people here. And as soon as we put it on, she started feeling itchy and scratchy. Yeah. And she wears our product all the time yeah. without a problem. Yeah. So you want to avoid free HEA, even if it has a comma in front of it and behind it in the ingredient list. Mm -hmm. Avoid it. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the deal. And when we go over the SDS sheets, we'll go over all of this as well. Great. Okay. Yeah, this is awesome. I think so. Thanks, Jim. Well, Liz, thank you for the opportunity. All right, guys. So hopefully this video has helped you understand a little bit more about what the heck HEMA is, how it causes allergies for us and our nail technic, or sorry, us and our clients, and also how to identify HEMA in the stuff that we're buying, using, and, and what we see out there on the marketplace. Yeah. And if you see it on the ingredient list or on the SDS sheet, 
Should you be concerned? Should you not be concerned? Absolutely. Yeah, because not all HEMA is evil. No, and not all concentrations of HEMA are bad. Yeah. A lot of it comes down to how you handle it. Absolutely. Yeah. And as Jim mentioned, you know, if you're seeing those kind of free form HEMAs or HEAs listed on your ingredient list, that is something that you can take under consideration and say, hey, you know, maybe I don't want to opt for a product like this. Maybe I want to look for something that does have those bound versions or has those lower concentrations. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. Or yeah. if you have a bottle that has no ingredients on it at all, be concerned. Oh. No ingredients on the bottle Oh, you at mean all. no listing whatsoever? No listing at all. Wait, does that actually exist? I thought you have to have ingredients on a bottle. Can I? Wow, this is crazy. No ingredients on this one at all. Not on the back, not on the bottom. Nowhere. nowhere. Wow. Yeah, so if you guys are also seeing products that don't have anything listed on it whatsoever, I mean, that's cause for concern. Cause for concern. If you see some of these products do come in a box and the ingredients might be listed on the box mm -hmm. or inside the box, that's different. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be listed on the bottle. Right. But I have seen products, no box, no outer packaging, and no ingredients anywhere. I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot Not ball. with a 10 foot ball. <laughs> and I definitely wouldn't put it on paying clients either. No, ma'am. Wow. All right. Well, I hope this has helped you. We will be in touch again soon with another awesome chemist corner meets nail hub video and if you guys have any questions always feel free to ask us anything i mean jim has the answers to almost any chemistry question you, well probably all chemistry questions you could ever have and we also want to make sure that this comes across as crystal clear as possible so that you guys are all able to make really really knowledgeable purchasing decisions exactly and it's also intended to enlighten yeah provide knowledge yeah. without demeaning or Den denigrating. denigrating, denigrating, denigrating anybody else. Absolutely. Yeah. You can denigrate me for not being able to say the word, but other than that. <laughs> yeah. Having core knowledge like this, I mean, I think is just a must for any of you guys out there. And even if you, you can't, you're, you're not into the big chemical words and it's really hard. And I know for, even for me, it's really hard to understand all of this stuff, but I think it's really important to be exposed to this type of education, to be aware that these things are out there. And I mean, even just the, little smidge of this type of education can really help to help you discern between a good product and one that might not be so good. Yeah. And if you understand smidge here and a smidge there, you can add up a whole bunch of smidges to make an oligomer smidge. Hey, I like that. Yeah. And yeah. then if you can do that, you get more, more understanding of the entire industry. Yes. All right, cool. Well, thanks so much, Jim. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for the opportunity. And we'll be in touch again next time. Bye.